My name is Martin Staudinger. I'm from Falter newspaper, and I have the honor to have Peter Konradi here with me. And the question, who lost Russia? Who lost Russia? This is a paramount uh, geopolitical question of our times, probably only surpassed by the issue of climate change. It's a question of war and peace. It's a question of security and instability. It's a question of wealth and poverty. And the answer to it is not only important when we try to figure out what happened in the past between Russia and the West, but also for the future because we can learn from it when, we, when it comes to shaping our relationship to Russia completely new. Who Lost Russia is also the title of a brilliant book by Peter Conradi. Welcome here again. Uh, and Peter is an old hand in foreign reporting uh, while working for Reuters and the newspaper The European. He was based in Zurich and Brussels, but more important for this evening, also in Moscow. And after quite some different, quite some time in different uh, jobs and employments at the Sunday Times, he is currently serving there as Europe editor. And he writes books, books like Hitler's Piano Player, The King's Speech, and Who Lost Russia. And Who Lost Russia earned enthusiastic reviews in the press. The literary review described it as fast-paced, comprehensive, solidly researched, and most importantly, essential reading for anyone who wants to understand one of the great crises of our times. And having read the book, I couldn't agree more. Some weeks ago, Peter finished an updated version of the book, which was originally published <laughs> in 27. This is <laughs> better to read, but let's leave it here. Um, and it's already covering uh, Russia's attempt to conquer Ukraine as a whole. So I'd like to structure the evening today in three parts. The past, meaning the years between 1989 and 2013. Then something I'd like to call the present, beginning with 2014, because <coughs> the war between the West and Russia, uh, between uh, <laughs> war against Ukraine, started already there. And probably at the end, uh, the future, dealing with the relationship between the West and Russia in the coming decades. But let's start with the probably most controversially discussed questions. When we listen to the Russian narrative, which is shared by quite a lot of people here in Europe, then contrary to a promise by NATO that there would, would be no enlargement towards the East, the alliance began a creeping encirclement of Russia, aiming to weaken Russia and eventually even to attack it. Peter, to your knowledge, was there a promise, an agreement, a settlement? Okay. First, uh, many thanks, Martin. Uh, ich sollte mich entschuldigen, dass wir das auf Englisch machen und nicht auf Deutsch, but uh, I would find it too difficult to express myself in German. So uh, if anyone afterwards wants to ask questions in German, I will probably understand, but uh, we will continue in English. Um, yeah, this is... This is, the, this is the, big, the big question. What did NATO promise? Uh, what didn't it promise? I mean, this is something that I, I discuss in the book, that there were a lot of discussions that took place in 1990 in the context of German reunification. Um, obviously, this was a sort of a, a crucial period because in order for Germany to reunify, Russia is one of the four powers, guarantee powers, guarantor powers, effectively needed to give its permission. So very well, well documented have been a number of discussions involving James Baker, involving John Major, the British Prime Minister, and so on. Um, there is this famous phrase that Baker said about not NATO would not expand by an inch. Um, now, Yes, there was a lot of discussion about it. The crucial thing, I think, is that no formal guarantees were given at the time. There was sort of verbal discussion, there were verbal guarantees. Um, I think in looking at it that there was a major mistake that was made by Mikhail Gorbachev, that he had a lot of 
on, on one level, he was in a very weak position because the Soviet Union was running out of money. It needed both Western banks and it needed Western governments. He was, on the other hand, he was in a strong position because he held the key to German reunification. He didn't demand any written guarantees. Uh, I had the, the pleasure of interviewing him by telephone, unfortunately, only about two years or so ago. Um, and I kind of raised the question with him, you know, did you make a mistake in not getting these guarantees? He was uh, inevitably um, quite defensive about what he had or hadn't done. Uh, and I'd like to quote in his own book when he wrote about uh, this question. And he said, uh, you know, when he asked if he had essentially had been outwitted by the West, he said, and I quote from Gorbachev, German reunification was completed at a time when the Warsaw Pact was still in existence, and to demand that its members should not join NATO would have been laughable. No organization can give a legally binding undertaking not to expand in the future. That was a purely political question, and all that could be done politically in the condition of time was done. You know, but he's obviously trying to, to justify himself, uh, and he doesn't want to be the man that basically messed up. So I suppose we have to look at the alternatives. What would have happened if NATO, you know, if we hadn't been in the current scenario, if NATO hadn't expanded? So I suppose there are two other possibilities. One was that NATO itself, as some people were urging at the time, should simply have been abolished and there should have been some new pan-European security structure in its place, uh, which was something that Mikhail Gorbachev himself wanted. He spoke a lot about a kind of a common European home, but it wasn't quite clear how in practice it would work. Or the alternative would have been NATO would continue to exist, but it wouldn't expand. So then one would have had a situation where what would have been the status of these countries, which were essentially between the edge of NATO, Germany, and the Soviet Union, and then Russia. And you know what would have been their status? There was some talk in the early 90s initially among in, in Poland in particular, that maybe they could form some kind of a, a kind of a confederate or some kind of security arrangement among themselves, some kind of mutual defense arrangement. But in a sense, by not allowing them to join NATO, they would have been effectively in this sphere of influence of Russia. And I think a lot of this discussion when we talk about NATO expanding or taking advantage of the Russians and so on, I find it quite insulting or quite dismissive of the interests of Poles, Hungarians, Czechs, everyone else. You know, they have a, a say in this as well. And I think they rightly looked back on their experience of the previous 40 years. They saw that Russia was weak. And they thought, we will take advantage of this weakness. We will get in there now and we'll anchor ourselves in the West. We will apply to join NATO and we'll apply to join the European Union. What I found uh, extremely interesting, as, you, uh, as far as you describe it, the USA you originally wasn't too keen to incorporate new members of NATO. No, I mean, again, I think we forget that today, that there is this, this narrative that this was America driving this process, it was the American sort of military-industrial complex, seeing um, profits to be made. Yes, they did see profits to be made, and they did do a lot of very lucrative deals to supply Western aircraft, other kind of Western military equipment that all these countries queuing up to join NATO were, you know, were keen to buy. But you know, there was, the, you know, there were concerns at the beginning. I mean, if, if as I detail in the book, Clinton himself. Bill Clinton, um, who was president from 92, was 
he was a little bit uncertain, and he was sort of talking to aides and, you know, are we sure this is a good idea? And, you know, it, it was the initiative, in a sense, came from there was a, a particular visit with the Lech Wałęsa, Václav Havel, and the Hungarian leader, whose name I've forgotten, um, who went simultaneously, who went together to, to, to see Clinton and was sort of pushing it. And so there was a lot in the first half of the 1990s, there was a lot of discussion about this. There was a suggestion at one stage that rather than incorporate these countries into NATO, they should be incorporated into something called the Partnership for Peace, which was set up. And there were two ways of seeing the Partnership for Peace. Was it a, an alternative to membership or was it a first stage? And there were big kind of debates about that. So I think the, you know, all this, I could go on and on for hours on the, sort of the details of who said what when, but there was a lot of, a lot of discussion in the 1990s and I think it was not a foregone conclusion what happened. On the other hand, you describe uh, an occasion later when Putin uh, even asked uh, the NATO General Secretary, when, w when will be an invitation to Russia? Was this only a joke, or do you think he really... Yeah, I mean, I, the, to which the response was, you don't get invited to join NATO, you have to apply. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, how, how would it have, you know, how would it have been? I mean, let's say there is a more fundamental problem, I think, underlying all of this, which is Russia's sheer size, its economic weight, its political power, its military power, makes it very difficult to integrate into another alliance, particularly into another alliance, which is led by someone else. Russia doesn't want to be an alliance led by someone, and, and you know, Understandably, but I mean that's the sort of the the root of the problem. I think that that you know if anything that includes Russia is changed, you know you can admit Slovenia into NATO and it doesn't affect NATO. You let Russia into NATO and it does. Mm -hmm. Let's go back uh, to the beginning of the relationship uh, after the breakdown of the Soviet Empire. Can you walk us through kind of a roadmap and hindsight? showing critical waypoints from the early 90s to, let's say, 2014, when everything escalated? Yeah, I mean, I was, uh, I lived in, in, in Moscow and traveled from 1988 until 1995. So I, I was based in Moscow, but I traveled around all over, all over Russia, all over the, the Soviet Union and so on. And I mean, in retrospect, uh, it was an extraordinary, or at the time, as it was an extraordinary period, and if we look back, it seems even more extraordinary. There was such a, a kind of an optimism, I think, on both sides. There was a great naivety on the side of the Russians, I think, uh, about what would now happen. There was this kind of conflation, this mixture of prosperity and Western-style democracy and the assumption that all you had to do was uh, get rid of communism, become democratic, and suddenly you'd be as rich as the Germans or the Austrians. Um, there was an assumption, I think, in America in particular, that you know, the problem was somehow dealt with. You know, the, the, the Soviet Union has collapsed, broken apart, communism has ended, the Cold War has ended. Okay, let's get on. Let's get on with other things. There was a particular economic recession in the early 90s as well, which was a preoccupation. So, you know, one looks back at that period. It was a, it was a kind of a, a crazy time. It was a, a time of um, great suffering for a large number of people uh, in Russia. It was also a time of extraordinary opportunity for a very small number of of people, the people we know as the oligarchs today, most of whom set out, started out in, you know, doing bizarre things like maybe getting on a plane to Turkey, buying five leather jackets, coming back, selling them in Russia for a huge markup, or selling bath plugs or or plastic ducks for the bath, or you know, all these kind of things. So there was this kind of period, but I think in the Russian collective memory, it's a period of 
economic chaos, of political chaos, of growing humiliation on the international stage by virtue of Boris Yeltsin's growing, how can we put it, unpredictability, uh, drunkenness, uh, ill health. All this is kind of bundled together. And I think the, the, in understanding Russian psyche today, in understanding the way, you know, and in understanding the appeal of Putin. I mean, you know, we shouldn't forget that, that you know, he is still probably popular in Russia. And he was very popular in Russia because he was the, he was the complete opposite of the 1990s. He was, he was the man that was going to come in and he was going to restore Russia's pride, I think. But the attitude towards the West was positive. It was positive, the, yes. It was, it, was, it was positive because you know, there was a feeling that, you know, I mean, let's say what, you know, there, there wasn't a feeling that Russia had been, let's say from a Western side perhaps, people saw, thought that they had won the Cold War. The Russians themselves didn't feel that they'd been beaten in a war. They felt that they had got rid of their communist leaders. They were looking forward to a bright future. And being friendly with the West was part of that, was part of that bright future. And I said it was very much mixed in with this hope of affluence, this obsession with Western consumer goods. I remember going to uh, Pushkin Square in the middle of Moscow in 1990 when the first McDonald's opened and watching the huge queues outside. And this was, you know, it was the, the American dream, I suppose. Um, and there was this, you know, you would go somewhere, I would go somewhere, I would go to any corner of the Soviet Union, and I would say, I would sort of speak Russian with my excruciating English accent, and they'd, oh, you know, Britain, wonderful, wonderful, or so on for every other foreigner. There was this extraordinary feeling, uh, which just gradually, gradually, as a, over the intervening 30 years, has, has, has disappeared completely. That's what I wanted to ask now. Was there a certain breaking point, or did the disillusion come gradually, and by what? Uh, so, I mean, I think one, you know, a dividing line is the departure of Boris Yeltsin at the end of 1999, um, and his replacement by his anointed successor, um, Putin, who he, people still remember, essentially Yeltsin, you know, did everything to put Putin into place. He stepped down from the presidency, appointed Putin as his acting president, as acting president in place of him. So then when there was an election, obviously Putin was, as the incumbent, was elected. So already by the late 1990s, things were beginning to sour to some extent, uh, because partly because Russia itself had a big economic crisis in 1997, uh, because NATO had begun to enlarge for these first three countries. There was also, I think people in, in, in the West underestimated the extent to which Kosovo um, the, the, the NATO's bombing of, of uh, Belgrade, how that really led to a deterioration, deterioration in relations. I mean, as far as certainly the British public was concerned, Milosevic and all his people were, you know, bad people, and they, they deserved what happened to them. From a Russian point of view, no. Um, and that's why whenever... Certainly in the context of the current crisis, people say, well, why are Russians so worried about NATO enlargement? NATO is a defensive organization. Russians will turn around and say, well, Kosovo, was, you know, was that defensive? That was, you know, offensive. So already by the time Putin came to power, there wasn't still this, you know, there wasn't this same euphoria. You know, there was still a lot of sympathy for the West. I think if one looks at opinion polls, you will probably see still an overall positive impression, but, but much, much lower. And then Putin came to power. Uh, initially, relations were, with him were good. 
Um, genuinely good. Yeah, genuine. I think genu- genuinely good. He was. I mean, it, it's it's. You know, we forget now how he seemed at the time. I and mean, if you look at video footage from that time, he's almost this kind of shy, almost hesitant kind of figure. I mean, I remember Tony Blair, I think, was the first uh, Western leader probably to go and see him. And he went to see him in the period when he was still um, acting president. He wasn't actually president. And so, in, in a sense, he became a, an accessory in Putin's election campaign, another thing perhaps one can blame Tony Blair for. Um, but... You know, there were the, it, it's often quoted from by, by, by the Russian side that after 9-11, Putin was the, I think, the first foreign leader to, to offer support, you know, verbal support to, to George W. Bush. Um, there was then this sort of willingness on Putin's part to uh, put pressure on the Central Asian countries to allow them to be used as a, as a sort of staging point for American attacks on... on uh, Afghanistan. So, you know, things were still fairly good in that initial period. And that was when there was this kind of Putin talking about joining NATO. You know, that, that was still, you know, that was, that was that period. Then what began to go wrong? Well, the Iraq war uh, led to a deterioration of, of relations because Russia, along with France and Germany, uh, obviously found itself on the side of uh, not supporting the war. Um, and I think also you then got, uh, you had events, the so-called color, color revolutions that we had in, 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 in Ukraine, in Georgia, in Kyrgyzstan, again in that period, 2003, um, which kind of were interpreted in Russia as being organized by, inspired by the West and being somehow as an attempt to undermine Russia. But I think also, so you've got these kind of, from a Russian perspective, these kind of negative events going on externally. And also internally, you got a Russia that was beginning to become much more self-confident. Again, it was becoming much more affluent. They were fortunate because there was a big increase in the price of oil in the early 2000s. So suddenly, Russia and Russians became much more affluent. Um, this is, you know, this was almost kind of a golden period. And as they became more affluent, and as, as they began to look back on the 1990s, they began to feel they had been pushed around, they'd been exploited uh, by the West. Do they have a reason to believe this? I mean, you know, if one looks at, again, you know, the economic events of the 1990s, this upheaval, the kind of the mass privatization of state enterprises, um, the so-called economic shock therapy, you know, the people, there was this sort of this narrative that began to develop where we were exploited by the, by the West, um, we weren't helped by the West, you know, but the people that became super, super rich out of it were the Russians themselves. It was one group of very smart or well-connected Russians who exploited the population. They were the ones that, that bought shares in uh, oil, oil enterprises or gas enterprises and at a fraction of the real value and so on. So I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's... it's you know, all the actors involved. It was a, the 1990s were a, a time, a real kind of wild west or wild east, and everyone who was there on an individual basis was just trying to get the most they could out of it. So just to, I mean, to continue the argument, so then you had these different things going on, and we reached a point, and there is a key point in 2007 when Putin went to the, the Munich Security Conference, big kind of annual event, and he basically made a speech in which he said, you know, essentially, we've had enough. We've had enough of being dominated. We've had enough of the West, America in particular, trying to impose this unipolar world on us. 
you know, it's got to stop. This was his kind of, in a sense, his wake-up call. Was this a missed chance, 2007, the security conference, a missed chance to prevent losing Russia if NATO, if the West would have reacted otherwise? Yeah, I mean, I mean what, what, what did happen was, in a sense, the opposite of that, because the following year, in 2008, uh, the NATO summit in Bucharest came, I think, probably one of the biggest mistakes, which was a decision by the summit to, in theory, open the door to NATO membership for Ukraine and for Georgia. Um, this, was, this was controversial because, okay, until then, gradually NATO had been expanding. It had taken in the former Soviet satellites. It had then taken in the three Baltic states, which, okay, had been part of the Soviet Union, but... You know, they were always, I think even from a Russian point of view, they, they weren't quite seen as part of the sort of the core Soviet Union. But to suggest that Georgia should become a part of NATO, and even more important to suggest that Ukraine should have become a part of NATO, was, you know, a huge step. And it was something that the Americans really pushed, uh, which the Germans... I think, rightly resisted. But in the end, it was there. But in, in a sense, it was almost the worst of both worlds because normally the process of joining NATO is that the, you, a so-called membership action plan is given to the country, which is sort of sets out the stages by which you join the alliance. In this case, they didn't do that. So it was a kind of a, almost a theoretical, one day you will be part of NATO, if you want, but we're not going to lay out a timetable. So this has been, this NATO membership has been kind of hanging in the air as a prospect, you know, ever since 2008. Is it reasonably for Russia to um, see its, as they say, legitimate uh, security needs being violated by inviting Ukraine, inviting or even just raising the possibility that Ukraine and Georgia could be NATO members? Is it legitimate? I don't know. I mean, would it be, would it be legitimate for the United States to raise an objection to Mexico being part of a, a potentially hostile um, military alliance? I mean, yeah, I mean, let's say the Russians naturally, and everyone knew the Russians wouldn't be happy about it. I mean, Georgia is, you know, less sensitive both militarily and culturally. Uh, you know, whereas, I mean, the Ukraine is, is, is you know, is, is such a, as, as far as the Russians are concerned, there is, it's, there's such a, and this is, I mean, this is, underlies the whole war with Ukraine now, I think. It's just this, unwillingness perhaps by some Russians to accept that Ukraine is really a separate a separate country uh, and is a legitimate separate country and anyone who's had the enough spare time to read Putin's very long essay about the history of Ukraine which he published last summer you have these kind of views on it and uh, you know you get into this sort of shared history going all the way back to Kiev and Rus many 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 centuries ago and and then a completely you know, you have, in a sense, two, as I describe in the book, you have like kind of two parallel views of history from, you know, you sat down, if you sat down a Ukrainian historian here and a Russian historian here, hopefully with some kind of barrier in between to stop them hitting each other, you know, you'd have a very lively debate about the history of that whole period. I mean, I, in a, I was once giving a, a talk about this book in, um, in Edinburgh, in Scotland, um, and I rather shocked the audience by saying to, you know, try and understand it, that essentially Russia is England and Scotland is Ukraine. And that as far as we English are concerned, it's all the same country, we're all the same people, we all speak the same language, you know, what's all the fuss about? Whereas if you're Scottish, you see things as, as you know, very different. You see yourself, your country as being not quite colonized, but being under the 
thumb of, 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 the, big, of the, the big brother. So therefore, you know, there is something very, very sensitive about, about Ukraine. And I mean, it's, it's notable that, you know, in 2008, um, there was this membership that was held out as a prospect. So nothing more happened about it, but also nothing more happened because in 2010, the president of Ukraine was uh, Viktor Yanukovych, who, who had previously um, tried to become president and, and, and sort of rigged the election, but he was legitimately elected in 2010. He was pro-Russian, and he didn't, you know, he didn't pursue NATO membership. So, and that, you know, that only changed when we had the, the dramatic events of 2014, when he was driven from power um, by one version says a popular uprising, the other version says a Western orchestrated popular uprising. That would be the Russian version. That would be the Russian version. And, you know, there's some, uh, there was a lot of encouragement from, from America, from other Western countries. And so then again, the question of NATO, NATO membership came back onto the agenda quite dramatically, but then in a very changed and much more um, difficult situation because by that time, Russia had annexed Ukraine and was encouraging, fermenting, stirring up a civil war effectively in the east of the country, in the Donbass. Did you find any evidence that 2014 would have been a staged coup by NATO, by the US, by the West? No, no, I don't. I mean, let's say there was a, it was, you know, there was a huge number of people on the streets in 2014 in the Maidan in the middle of uh, Kiev. Um, walking among them were, you know, members of, American, of the American Congress, uh, Victoria Nuland, uh, a senior figure in the, in the State Department. I mean, there was sort of bizarre scenes where they were sort of handing out, I think she, Nuland was there with like a bag of bread and was kind of handing it out, almost like you might feed the ducks in a, in a lake or something, or the animals in the zoo or whatever. I mean, so there was a, a lot, and German politicians were there. I mean, there was very, very overt Western support for it. Um, to say that the whole thing was masterminded from the beginning by the West, I think, is, is far-fetched. <clears throat> and then... 2014, the annexation of the Crimean Peninsula, uh, the, let's say, de facto annexation of the Donbass. Um, the West quite easily went back to business as usual afterwards. Yes. What would be the lessons learned for Russia from this development? Yeah, I mean, there were, there were some, there were some Sanctions, uh, but not particularly, not particularly strong ones. Um, and you know, it's interesting also. You know, the media, the media attention. I remember, you know, at the time, 2014 was uh, a huge story. Everyone was there. Everyone was reporting from there. But gradually, it joined this long list of forgotten wars. Um, no one much was writing about it. Um, in the meantime, contacts were being reestablished. Um, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline was being agreed. Um, and I mean, it was quite notable, I think, that there was, you know, let's say that the Western countries were not recognizing the, were not recognizing the annexation of Crimea, but you know, they weren't doing anything about it in the same way that most Western countries never recognized the annexation by the Soviet Union of the three Baltic states. But, you know, they didn't do anything about it. They didn't try and fight to get them back. So we had this kind of situation, I think, during that period between 2014 and 2022, <coughs> now, um, where there was a feeling, particularly in, in France, I think, and in Germany as well, that we needed to sort of essentially move on um, to kind of normalize relations. Um, President Macron, uh, after his election in 2017, one of the first people he, he actually welcomed to, 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 to France was, was Putin. 
And uh, two years later, there were very, very kind of serious discussions about, you know, in a sense, how we could perhaps establish that security structure that maybe should have been established back in the early 90s. Um, you know, not disbanding NATO, but just trying to find a way of, of integrating Russia. But, you know, as we saw it, it didn't get anywhere. Did we read Putin completely wrong the whole time? From 2000, hmm. over 2013 until now? That's a, that's, that's, it's a very interesting question because it's, it, you know, fundamentally, I suppose, there are two ways of looking at this. One of them is we got it wrong in the West. Putin would have been our friend and we turned him into our enemy, one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is actually he was... You know, he's the classic, I mean, it's like cliche, he's the classic KGB man, you can't trust Maskerov, him. He's yeah. Mas hmm? Maskerov. Or exactly, yeah, yeah. And, and you, can't, you can, can't trust him, and that, that he is trying always to get the maximum, and as he gets more and more, as he gets more and stronger, uh, he can try and get more. Um, and, I mean, you know, coinciding again, I mean, something one should touch on also is the changing nature of, Russia itself, the domestic situation. You know, Russia in the late 90s was a, a chaotic place, but it was a very, you know, free place. You know, newspapers could write what they liked, people could say what they liked, um, and that gradually after Putin came to power, you had a situation where he took control over, of, of state television, gradually eliminated forms of opposition. And, you know, there's a sense in which this growing repression, this growing control at home went hand in hand with a, a much more aggressive foreign policy. Foreign policy. So, no easy answer to the question, who lost Russia? Nope. On Twitter, <laughs> somebody suggested uh, only one name, Condoleezza Rice. Yes, that was that was that was. It was quite interesting because I, I just tweeted uh, today just the fact this event was going on, and um, someone replied from I don't know from Ireland, I think. Or, well, ah, the answer to the question is Condoleezza Rice. Well, in a sense that that goes back to this decision in 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 two thousand and eight uh, to name Ukraine and Georgia as members. I think a little simplistic, <laughs> of course. Uh, let's talk a little bit of, uh, about the ongoing situation in, in Ukraine. Um, we saw quite successful military actions of Ukraine during the last days. We don't know if this is sustainable uh, at the moment. But uh, the West has been uh, delivering quite a lot of uh, weapons and ammunition to Ukraine. And it has been imposing sanctions against Putin and his cronies. Do you think <coughs> this is the right thing to stop the war? Do you think it is the is right the right thing to do now? Um, I think you know what has the events of the last ten days. I think have been have been quite extraordinary. Uh, I mean, I have I have a, a colleague from my newspaper, a young woman, and she's been in in that area, and she said it's it's you know it's extraordinary just quite how quickly the Russian forces ran away. Um, now I think. You know, it's not clear before everyone celebrates the, the defeat, or not everyone, those that want to celebrate the defeat of Russia. Um, you know, I think we have to see what happens next from a military point of view. You know, all those forces that, that, that ran away, are they, are they going to regroup and are they going to, to come back again? Um, but I think the combination of um, Ukrainian courage, Ukrainian determination, the fact that they are actually fighting on their home ground against the Russians, plus the huge, huge influx of American and, and European arms is, is obviously a very, very powerful combination um, that leaves Putin in a, in a difficult situation because he logically one would think, okay, he needs to, you know, Russia is a much bigger country than Ukraine, it's, it's much more powerful militarily, uh, 
he should be basically declaring a full mobilization. He should throw everything into this war if he wants to win. However, he has the problem of public opinion. There is maybe a small number of people who want him to do that, who are getting angry with him, but getting angry with him not for having invaded Ukraine, but for having, but for losing. I mean, the sort of the patriotic wing, one could say. The military bloggers. Yeah, the, 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 mili the military bloggers who affect, you know, who do reflect, I think, a slice of opinion in, in Russia. You know, the, the humiliation, you know, Russians can be patri are patriotic, you know, you, the, the fact of being humiliated by the Ukrainians goes down very badly with some people. But the problem is that in order to, to, to turn this from a special military operation into a, into a, a full-scale war, apart from the kind of the technical problems, you know, how do you actually organize the draft of, of, of soldiers and so on, it's going to take time. It's not, you know, it's not going to be something you can do overnight. The other problem is, you know, what about this mass of Russians in the middle? Maybe it's been estimated perhaps 40% or so who are kind of largely indifferent to the war, who see the war as something that is going on away from them. It's not directly affecting them. Um, you know, they, they, they maybe watch it on TV or they probably switch off the TV because they're bored with watching it. And they, you know, they're prepared for this to go on much in the same way as when the Soviet Union was fighting Afghanistan. It was somewhere far away. But if they start being called up to go and fight or if their sons get called up to go and fight, it's going to be very, very different. And at the moment, I mean, as you and I were discussing earlier, a lot of the soldiers fighting on the Russian side are from some of the ethnic republics, be it from, from Chechnya, Buryatia, uh, various other kind of faraway places, in a sense, where, which don't, you know, which doesn't really have much impact on the things that really matter to Putin, which is essentially the mood in Moscow and the mood in St. Petersburg. But if you start recruiting young Moscovites, then, you know, are they, before they get recruited, are they going to go out on the streets? Are they going to protest? Are they going to challenge the regime? So it's, he's kind of got himself into a, a kind of a, a trap of his own making, which has come, I think, just from a either, you know, very, very bad information. He goes back to the beginning of the war and the very, very bad impression, I think, that he was given that somehow... You could send the troops in that uh, Zelensky was some kind of, yeah. is an actor, was some, who would just run off um, and the whole thing would collapse. And, you know, he just clearly wasn't fought through, fought, thought through. Um, and six, seven months later, you know, we see the consequences and it's this dilemma that he's essentially created for himself. I don't know how it is in the UK, but uh, in Germany and Austria, there are basically two camps. The one camp is saying we do have to send more weapons. We do have to help the Ukraine to defend itself militarily and uh, militarily in the future as well. And there's another, the other camp that says uh, let's just stop, start talking now. Let's have peace talks. Let's have uh, negotiations. Where would you tend to? It's interesting. I mean, I think that before the Ukrainian advance of the past 10 days, one could reach it, one could sort of think, one, one, one could, one, let's say I would have had sympathy for the situation that, you know, this looked like it was going to be a war that would go on for a long, long time um, and would be complete stalemate. And so in that context, you know, one could say, okay, we're going eventually to have to talk, so what are we waiting for? When you have a situation as we have now, where suddenly the dynamic seems to have changed, I think that that undermines that argument because it says, well, actually, if, you know, the best solution would be for the Russians to leave Ukraine. And that if that is actually going to be possible, 
then now is not the time to try and do a peace deal. Uh, but also, if you look at what, you know, what, would a peace, what would an acceptable peace deal be to both sides? What would the Ukrainians accept? Um, you know, the, the, the problem is the better the war goes for them, the less likely they are to, to accept any, any compromise. And I think what is perhaps quite alarming is that, you know, in the discussion, particularly after, as the war is going better, the question of the Ukrainians say, well, we want to not only go back to the situation before February 24th, we want to get the Russians out of the Donbass, and we want to get the Russians, we want to reclaim Crimea. Mm -hmm. Now, I haven't been to Crimea for a long time, but I'm not sure how welcome the Ukrainians would be in Crimea. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but I, I think, in a sense, we should wait a few weeks to see if this, you know, if there is a Russian counterattack, or whether the, the kind of the situation continues, the, the Ukrainians continue to have the momentum. Mm -hmm. Do you see any cracks in the system, in the Putin system? I, cracks in the system. I mean, I think you know it gets back to the situation that he finds that he finds himself in, um, which is an uncomfortable is an uncomfortable situation, because you know he's not used to being in this kind of situation. I mean, no, I mean, no one knows what's going on in the Kremlin. I certainly don't, and uh, you know the people that do are not are not telling the world about it. Um, but, you know, the longer this situation persists, you know, he, there, is going to re, there is going to be, I suspect, some kind of a crunch point. Mm -hmm. When and where and what form it will take is, is just impossible to predict. So let's talk a little bit about the future, and afterwards we will take some questions. Um, I mean, we don't know how long Putin will be president and who will eventually succeed him. <laughs> Um, and we don't know if there is any further escalation ahead, but what goes for an, for an authoritarian Russia can also go for China or for other countries uh, with grievances about the past and with territorial uh, demands and ambitions for the future. Every case is unique, mm -hmm. of course, but still, what can we learn in dealing with such countries? What can the West learn? Hmm. Gosh, goodness me, that's a very broad question, isn't it? I, I would say, that having mentioned, I will try and I will try and dodge it um, by trying to expand on another point, which uh, taking advantage of the fact you mentioned China, I thought what was quite interesting at the summit last week in in Uzbekistan, uh, where the Chinese were there and the Indians were there, was the extent to which that you know the Chinese are beginning to be not quite as as supportive as they had been initially. I mean, what was, there was this, this phrase from Xi Jinping about uh, a friendship without limits that they were offering uh, Russia before the invasion. Uh, now I think these limits are beginning to appear. We've got the Indians who were initially, uh, not, I mean, not supportive, but not really condemning the invasion who are um, now beginning to express some some misgivings uh, as well. So I mean that that's an interesting dimension. I think that the um, this kind of can we call it the, sort of the, the people around let's say Putin, the people who Putin could rely on for support or basically not for opposition are beginning to I think question the wisdom of what he's done. But I mean to try to get back to your your question, I, you know, what lessons does this teach us for China and Taiwan? I honestly don't know. <laughs> I'm not an expert on China. I mean, it, you know, to some extent it's, okay, it's an analogous situation, but, you know, China is a very, very different country from, from Russia, I think. But at some point, this war will end as well. And uh, can, must there be a normalization with Russia and can it happen? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it depends, it really depends how the war ends, obviously, and whether Putin survives the ending of the war. So if the war ends on some terms that Putin can, can sell as a, 
a victory, then we will face the question of, of do we normalize relations with him? And I think, you know, I would probably say not, um, particularly since all the efforts that are being made to reduce energy dependence on Russia, I mean, quite painful efforts that are being made here, I think in Germany, I mean, across, across Europe, um, suddenly after all of that to say, okay, fine, it's all over, can you start sending some gas now back, open the tap again? Um, I think there will be reluctance, there will be reluctance to do that. But, you know, on the other hand, it, you know, it's, it, Russia is a huge place, it's there, it's not going anywhere, it's, we can't sort of cut it loose and float it off somewhere to the east, we can't build a big wall around it. Um, you know, there will have to be some kind of relations. But I think, you know, the assumption that uh, if Putin goes, he will be suddenly replaced by some Western friendly liberal figure I, you know, is, I think, naive and uh, not very plausible. Um, you know, whoever, whoever eventually replaces Putin because he's not immortal, um, you know, this is, will represent Russia, will represent a country that has its particular national interests, which will want to assert its natural in, national interests as all countries do. Uh, and it just depends really on the manner in which they, they assert those interests, I think. Peter, thank you very much. Uh, we will be taking some questions now. Just a moment. And jetzt habe ich meinen Zeit im Bild zwei Moment. Uh, mir wurde gesagt, wir sollen uns jetzt verabschieden von den Zuseherinnen und Zusehern, die auf Social Media dabei waren. Guten Abend aus Wien. <lacht> <lacht>